So welcome to this episode of uh, Be Well and Have an Edge with me, Martin Frenzen, chiropractor of, in Old Town, Stockholm, Sweden. And today I have the honor to have a fellow chiropractor, but you're not only a fellow chiropractor. Simon Sensen, you are a PhD a researcher. You published uh, loads of books that I have and that I think every chiropractor and even lay person, I have even more, should be reading these uh, books. And you run the uh, Institute of Chiropractic, which you have just yeah. you told me when we talk, spoke earlier that you rebranded it and it's for chiropractors and chiropractic students to get in touch with our history in a true manner and which you're going to shed light to us today from uh, peer-reviewed research. That's what you do. It's not just like many chiropractors, when you see it, say philosophy, it's like a almost like a dirty word, but it's uh, much more than that. Right. Absolutely. Well, thanks. It's great to be here. I'm really happy to connect with you and share and uh, talk some history, philosophy, because it's, yeah. it's important for people to really understand where we came from and why we do what we do. Yeah. So we can, um, I've got some slides if you want, I could share some slides. Great. Okay, great. Great. Okay. Let's Let rock me... from here. The spine of chiropractic. Yes. And then we, we chose that as sort of our, um, our go-to uh, explanation for um, our, the new site, the, the new launching of the website, the Institute Cairo, which I'll, I'll be happy to talk more about. And, but I want to just kind of get into what that means. So unlocking the spine of chiropractic is really, from my perspective, understanding the history, understanding the philosophy, understanding how chiropractic uh, discourse got to the point that it is today, where from, from my perspective, there's a lot of misunderstanding and confusion in the profession. And a lot of that originates in people not completely understanding the history yeah. and also mistakes in the literature. So, so the first way of unlocking that and really opening that up for the whole profession is to give us the facts and to understand our history and understand what where the mistakes happened mm. and then looking at it from a really holistic viewpoint to understand how can we just help more people to understand the truth and the facts of the matter. So I just want to go back to some history so people can really have a context so uh, this is one of my favorite charts to understand um, how chiropractic developed. And this is from the United States, but there was a, a moment in United States history and chiropractic where um, the, the medical lobby was trying to stop the chiropractic profession. So, and they were losing their battle. There were new chiropractic laws getting passed. There were new chiropractic boards. Chiropractors were winning in the courtroom, which we'll talk about in a little while. Mm. So the medical lobby started to pass these laws in all of these states in the United States. So here you can see when the, when the laws were passed and then when they were, um, when they were revoked, Right. So here's, um, for example, you've got um, Wisconsin as the first state, 1925 to 1975. So what these laws were, they were called basic science laws. And you could see the latest one went up to 1979. And yeah. basically they stated that in order for chiropractors or really any healers, but it was really targeted at chiropractors, to be able to get a license in those states, they had to pass a basic science exam. Hmm. And the exams were written by the professors in the medical schools. Yeah. So the chiropractors were not really prepared to pass these tests. And in some of these states, um, licensure went down to zero for years at a time because hmm. chiropractors were just being shut out of the states. And I published a paper several years ago going through this history. This was this is from the paper, and and I actually looked at it from uh, perspectives of in, 
levels of complexity of thinking. It's really a rich paper that has history and theory kind of all intertwined together. Mm-hmm. And, and the key, I think, was how this, you know, one of the essential things that I got was how the chiropractors dealt with this, right? And there was there was already a split in the profession. There were the straight chiropractors and there were what they used to call the mixers, right? But most people don't really understand that the mixer chiropractors, those were generally chiropractors who focused on vertebral subluxation, correction, and adjustment, assessment and adjustment of vertebral subluxation as the main chiropractic practice. Mm. And then they added to that naturopathy, homeopathy, physical therapy, either before or after the adjustment. But the chiropractic adjustment of subluxation was central for the whole profession. But the debate was, do we be more and more like medical doctors or do we keep chiropractic as a separate and distinct profession? And that was really the discourse between these two sides. So when these basic science laws came out, there was a, a, a split in the academics, the, the professors at the colleges of how can we help our students to get licensed. Yeah. So the mixer side of the profession, their focus was more, let's become more medical. Let's take medical textbooks. Let's get more medical professors in our classrooms and let's teach more medical subjects. The straight chiropractors felt that that would be too confusing for chiropractors because the paradigms were op- opposing. The chiropractic paradigm was that when there was a subluxation, it would cause a disruption to the nervous system, which would lead to a pathophysiological process, yeah. right? Which chiropractors refer to that as dis dash ease right so it's not a disease process but it's a pathophysiology that could cascade into a disease process and the idea of the adjustment was to break that pattern and stop the interference to the nervous system's function so that the the system could normalize so the straight chiropractors felt we should look more to the basic sciences. We should look more to scientific theories. They integrated ideas like Selye's theory of stress, um, Speransky's model of uh, his theory on the basis of medicine. And they integrated these sort of leading edge scientific theories that were congruent with the philosophy of chiropractic mm. into subluxation theory. So there was a a different approach completely in the profession on how to deal with these things. So I drew up this chart. I taught a class the other day for um, uh, the advanced philosophy class, applied philosophy at Life West. And I wanted them to understand how this sort of politics emerged. And this is all based mostly on the United States, but, you know, in these early days, and a lot of this impacted Europe and the rest of the world thereafter, right? But this is the foundation of a lot of how a lot of the international organizations really got their start. So I'll just give you sort of a quick overview of this. It's not something that people really need to master, but you know, it's a good basis to understand the evolution of the history. So here we've got in the upper left there, the UCA, and that was B.J. Palmer's first professional organization. And it started in 1906. And it was really set up to help chiropractors who were being um, arrested, right, to get them lawyers and get them defense and actually pay money to their families. Because chiropractors were being arrested for practicing medicine and osteopathy without a license. They were being targeted by medical boards and then they were being thrown into prison. So the UCA was set up to give them a defense and also send money every week and every month to their families so they could survive. And that organization went right into the 1920s And there was a competing organization at the time for the the mixer side of the profession, which was the first ACA. 
And for some of those guys, they they wanted to separate the school leaders, wanted to separate themselves from B.J. Palmer, because not only was he the head of the largest school, but he was also secretary of the UCA. So here you had the head of a school who was also, you know, one of the leaders of the, the association, right, which was not good for business for a lot of the other schools, right? So there was part of it was, you know, politics. And also the, the this first ACA, they didn't like the motto of go to jail for chiropractic, right? They were trying to create this profession and have doctors with a higher standing and they didn't want them getting arrested because that became the strategy because chiropractors were winning in the courtroom. So the strategy was go to jail, win in the courtroom, and that would be a win for the chiropractic profession. Yeah. So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so then in the 1920s and 30s, these organizations split apart here a little bit. You could see the CHB was formed, which became the ICA, which was BJ Palmer's groups. And then the NCA, this was the mixer side of the profession, that became the today's ACA, the, Chiro the uh, American Chiropractors Association. But to me, what's very interesting is all of these organizations you could see on the right side of the screen. I mean, these guys were very forward thinking. They realized that in order for them to combat this um, push against the profession, especially from the medical lobby, they needed money, they needed research, and they needed accreditation standards. So mm -hmm. for, for money, they started the NCIC here, which was uh, the first malpractice association. Mm -hmm. So chiropractors paid this malpractice insurance, basically. And then that money was used to support the research and also to support the new um, accrediting standards. Yeah. So and that's the thing I really want to focus on for you guys. And you can see this was kind of complex and interesting how these groups have evolved. But the thing that really um, was was that really took shape was the fight for accreditation. Right. So there were these two groups. Right. There was the ICA, which was B.J. Palmer's straight yeah. chiropractic group. And there was the ACA, what was then called the NCA. And both groups had their own accrediting agencies. They were both accrediting their own groups of schools. Yeah. The ACA group and their, their accrediting agency became the CCE, which is still around today. And, and the ICCE was a branch from that, right? Or the, the, Europe, the ECCE rather, right? The European branch. So that group originally started back in those days and the the guys in charge of it, Nugent and this other guy, Watkins, they basically took the medical school curriculum and said, let's just take out drugs and surgery and let's put in chiropractic analysis and adjusting and maybe physical therapy. And we'll basically have a curriculum already made. This is what the medical schools use. So we'll use the same curriculum. Yeah. And these guys got together, the guys on the screen here, and these were the leaders of schools, right? The, the leaders of, they called themselves the Allied Chiropractic Educational Institutions. And this was Ratledge, who was an old friend of D.D. Palmer's back from 1908 or, or 1906, when D.D. Palmer had moved to Oklahoma. Uh, Willard Carver and Ratledge were both living in Oklahoma. Carver was an old friend of Dee Dee's. He had opened a school. He taught Ratledge. And then Ratledge and Dee Dee became friends and they, their wives were friends. They would go out to dinner. They would spend nights together. And then years later, when Dee Dee taught in his final years in Southern California, he was actually teaching at Ratledge's school. Right. So Ratledge was one of the last of D.D. D. Palmer's students, really, and an old friend. Carver was an old friend. Um, of course, B.J. Palmer. Um, Jim Drain was taught by B.J., but he also sat in on D.D. Palmer's last lectures that when he came through Davenport in 1913. And then, of course, Cleveland. And, you know, so these guys were sort of the last of the D.D. Palmer students 
right. who were still holding schools, who still had schools. So they were the leaders of the profession. And they put out an ultimatum together. And they said to the mixers in the profession, if you publish your new standard, because there, there was a threat that the mixer side was not only going to publish their new standard curriculum, but they were going to list the schools that they had already approved. So this was the first sort of preliminary accreditation. And this wouldn't be good for business for the other schools if this organization came out and said, these are the approved schools in the United States. Mm -hmm. So they came out with an ultimatum and they said, if you publish this standard, and the standard includes physical therapy and naturopathy. We feel that anyone taking boards, there's those, those topics, physical therapy and naturopathy should not be on a chiropractic board because yeah. a chiropractic exam, right? Because chiropractic is really the detection and correction of vertebral subluxation. So chiropractic boards should focus on our specialty. And those are other professions that we're sort of co-opting into chiropractic, which have their own exams, their own licensing, their own boards. So we're drawing a line in the sand and if you publish this new standard and this new list, we're kind of going to wash our hands of you and we're kind of done. Mm. And then, of course, you know what happened. They publish it the next year. And by over the next decades, they use their power and their clout and all that stuff you saw on the right side of the screen there, all the money and organizations they were creating. And they were also integrating it with the new state licensing boards and they basically forced 44 private schools to turn to nonprofit schools and start to amalgamate. So schools were being closed. Um, they were proposing that philosophy be done away with. And by the end of this, by 1955, there were only eight schools left out of 44 that were happening. And this was all part of this process. So the, the straight chiropractors kept sort of pushing against this and i'm just i'll wrap up this side of the discussion in a minute just just to get the history i think is important yeah so so jump ahead a few decades now we're going into the 1970s and in early 1970s 1973 um, medicare in the united states became approved approved chiropractic for the first time so that meant the united states government now acknowledged reimbursement to chiropractors for chiropractic but written into the law was only for the detection and correction of subluxation mm -hmm. so that was now the this you know the united states government approved subluxation based chiropractic only mm -hmm. so there, now there was a whole new level of pressure in the profession to confront that and deal with that so there was also the need to get the accrediting agencies approved by the United States government. So the straight organization, they formed their own group called the ACC. And here you can see some of the leaders of the time. Um, you've got Dave Palmer there. You've got Harper. You've got Cleveland's. And they got together with, um, I'll show you that chart again, so just so you can get the concept. So that ACEI, that's 1940 there. Yeah. And they formed this ACC in the bottom left there. That's the straight group accrediting agency. Right around the same time, if you go all the way to the right side, you can see the CCE formed. Mm -hmm. So both groups now had their own accrediting agency. And they both went to the U.S. Department of Education to say, we want you to approve our agencies and the U.S. government said, we'll only approve one agency. Mm. So you guys need to get together and have a binding mediation, which, which happened. I'll, I'll give you a quick aside just, just to have more of the context. This was the ACA's statement on chiropractic, which also came out in 1973. 
And it was all about subluxation. This was written by the leaders of all the ACA schools. So it's important for people to get subluxation was always central to all the schools in the profession for the first hundred years. But this is what happened. They had that meeting. They had the mediation meeting. They came to an agreement, but nobody signed it. And then the next day, the CCE resubmitted their application without telling anybody. And the U.S. government, you know, just kind of went, oh, you met all the things that we said you should fix. Stamp, stamp, stamp. You are approved. And so th and that was the CCE that represented these five schools, mm -hmm. which represented um, 1,352 students. Oh. The, the ACC schools, which were now completely shut out of accreditation, represented 3,460 students, right? So the majority of the profession was now out, had no control over their own accrediting standards anymore. Hmm. So the, the minority took over accreditation in chiropractic. That's what happened. And they also um, coordinated with the state associations and ask them to lobby their state governments to pass laws that would only allow graduates from CCE schools to get licensed. Mm. So, and that happened all across the states. So the, the other schools, the straight schools were really forced to become part of CCE. So yeah. that was a, a whole nother saga. And there were lawsuits and all kinds of incredible things of, our chiropractic history. So this is when, you know, there was some real, real struggle in the profession around identity, around accreditation. Um, and then I'll just jump to this one. Also around the same period, there was a, a conference held in 1975. So the United States government now, and people don't realize that there was quite a lot of research going on back then. It, it wasn't... Um, you know, cl uh, controlled clinical trials like our standards are, might be today, right? Because that was really a new concept back then. But for decades into the 40s, 50s, 60s, there was research on chiropractic, on subluxation, on disc herniations, all kinds of things in all the schools mm. to the point where the U.S. government said, the, the Congress said, there's enough evidence to support chiropractic that we want to hold a conference. So they allocated $2 million to have a spinal, uh, basically it was a chiropractic research conference. Hmm. But the researchers, the, the chiropractors involved, there were about 11 chiropractors. It was led by Scott Haldeman. Um, Dr. Chris Kent was was at the meeting. He was a new professor at Palmer at the time. And he was there and they got together. Chris Kent disagreed, but they got together and decided first that they would change the name of the conference, take chiropractic out of the title and call it spinal manipulative therapy. Because they wanted to be more in alignment with osteopathic manipulative therapy. Uh -huh. And they, they wanted to attract more scientists to the conference that would osteopathy scientists and spinal scientists. Mm -hmm. So, so that was one strategic move they made. Another move was they, they wanted to focus the conference less on um, somatovisceral complaints, which was traditionally that was the, the meat and potatoes of chiropractic, right? People were carried into chiropractors as the doctor of last resort that the medical doctors couldn't help. And then in many cases, they walked out or got healthy or had a turnaround. And that, that's how chiropractic grew, right? It was somatovisceral complaints was a central component. But the researchers at this conference decided that it would be easier to get um, funding for research if they focus more on headaches and back pain. Mm. So they decided to focus, let's make chiropractic more focused on headaches and back pain and less on subluxation and somatovisceral complaints. So this was a 
turning point in the profession because the researchers started to shift their focus away from traditional chiropractic things and more towards back pain and neck pain. So you can see what started to happen from there, right? It's it's quite it's quite an amazing history. Yeah. Um, this was one of our leaders, uh, one of the thought leaders in the profession back then, R.J. Watkins. Uh, we published a book a few years ago on, on his collected writings, which is just essential. It's called The Complete Chiropractor. Mm. And this was the consensus of the thought leaders back then, that subluxation is a demonstrable mechanical entity. Our, our research is clear that it's, it's a phenomenon that is worthy of a profession, that is worthy of good sound research and theory. So that sort of evolved. There were a couple other important elements that happened during this time. Um, there was one paper given by um, Howe, who was one of the, he and RJ Watkins were among the first eight uh, diplomats in x-ray. And Howe gave this paper in the 1970s, soon after this conference, and he said, we should no longer use the term subluxation. We should use manipulative therapy because mainly because of Medicare, because we don't want the other insurance companies to only pay for subluxation. We want chiropractors to get paid for anything that they do in their practice. So if we change our language, then we can make sure everybody gets more money. And I asked him about this. I interviewed him a few years ago. He was 89 and he, I said, did you realize that when you gave that paper, people would stop focusing on subluxation? And he looked a little uncomfortable. <laughs> he wasn't that happy with it. So this was a follow-up conference that they had. And then, and then the peer review literature started to show up um, in interesting ways. So JMPT came out at that time, which was the first um, chiropractic publication and you can still see, you can see they're using that same language now manipulative therapeutics and that became accepted into PubMed so it was considered the first scientific peer-reviewed journal in chiropractic and then the chiropractic history journal came out around this time period um, which and the chiropractic history association was formed so it's a really an interesting time. And I think it's important to understand how we got to there to really get where, what's going on today and, and how people understand the history and philosophy today. For sure, yeah. That's great, yeah. Bit of a whirlwind there, yes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. I like to, you know, throw it all out there and keep people on the edge of their seats. Yeah. Uh, so so now when, one thing that I've really focused on, so I've been studying these, these texts, these chiropractic history journals, the JMPT journals going back to the 70s, you know, and, and I've been for years, you know, I graduated in 1999 from Sherman, and I already had my master's degree in philosophy, and I had already had a history degree in, um, uh, in bachelor's in history. So I was always reading the references and tracing the references and trying to understand how they're shaping their arguments and what they're basing their fact claims on. And I'd always noticed discrepancies of things that seemed either biased or, or poor scholarship. But it wasn't until the last few years when I undertook my PhD and I started publishing papers in, in more volume i've published i think 33 peer review papers now and where i've really been able to see the problems because because one one interesting thing is now um we know more now about the history than these guys did back then when they started publishing about the history hmm. right because today we have access to digitized newspapers digitized archives, um, new historical finds. You know, there's, there's so much more. We, we probably know a hundred times more about D.D. Palmer and early chiropractic than any of these early authors did. So when they were publishing papers about 
chiropractic and about history, not only did they bring their own biases to these journals, because these weren't PhD scholars necessarily, these were chiropractors who were not really trained in running journals necessarily. Some were, and you know, we can't excuse some of them, right? But but it's important to get that any mistakes that they had were generally with the best knowledge that they had at the time. Hmm. But today we could correct it because one thing that happens, you know, I played that game when they were a child where you sit in a circle and you whisper something to someone and it goes around. And when it comes back to you, it to something totally different, right? That's what happens in the peer review literature, right? Somebody will publish something whether it's factual or not, that be, if it's published in peer review, it's considered scientific fact, mm. right? I mean, the, the reality is a scientific discovery is not considered valid. It's not even considered a real discovery until it's been published in peer review. Yeah. And that becomes the bricks of the foundation of science, so that chiropractic has its own peer-reviewed journals means that it's not only has its own literature, it's a part of the scientific literature. So we need to be accountable to that. And we need to go back and look at what papers are still being cited and referenced back from these early days that had errors being used for arguments yeah. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's been my, my real focus lately. So I'm just going to go through the, the two papers I published in the last um, couple of years. This, this one just came out last month and we've still got, what did you say, about 20 minutes or so? Or Yeah. 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 yeah good. Good. So this one came out with my two co-authors. Um, we, we published the definitive guide to the green books together a few years ago. And while I was working on my PhD, they continue to do research, of course. Uh, we've got a new book coming out, actually a couple of new books that will be coming out. But this was sort of a side project they were working on, and they asked me to come on board and help shape it into a paper, which we did over the last year. And they gave us the cover of the latest issue of Chiropractic History, which is a, a great honor. Um, and what we wanted to see was what, what, what were the very first chiropractic books? Yeah. And th this is important because it goes into that idea of the chiropractic literature and how accurate it is and how we need to make our choices today based on how accurate our literature is. So I'm not going to go through all of these details. I, I taught this to a history class at Sherman a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Kent's class. Um, but I'll just go over some of the essentials with you. Like, why is this important? Yeah. Like, and basically, this is the this is the discussion in the literature. There were there were two books published in 1906, D.D. and B.J. Palmer's Volume One of the Green Books, which is called The Science of Chiropractic, yeah. and Smith, Langworthy, and Paxson's book Modernized Chiropractic. Mm. Now. Most people believe that modernized chiropractic was published first because that's what the literature has been saying for decades. Mm. And so Tim and Joe went back and said, what's the real evidence for that? People say it, but what's the actual evidence? So they went back and went down these rabbit holes to really look at, you know, what's, what do we know? What's possible? And, and basically, they, they basically found that it's not true, which is really an interesting thing. But another thing we found was, what are the problems in the literature about how people thought that was true, right? And I found this image, and I thought this was, this was kind of how I looked when I was working on my PhD, chasing references and finding flaws and mistakes. And maybe we'll do a whole nother lecture like this where we could talk about my thesis I'm actually going to introduce my results at Sherman's IRAPS this year in May at, at, um, at Sherman's Lyceum. Yeah. But let's just talk about this. And this goes, these go together. This paper goes together with another paper I published a few years ago. And, and it all goes back to this uh, learner report 
And these are, this is a eight volume report that is sitting in the archives at Palmer Chiropractic College. And there was this guy named Cyrus Lerner, and he was hired by chiropractors in New York State in the 1950s because they wanted to pass a law in New York State to license chiropractors. So they hired this lawyer and they asked him to figure out what was the early history of chiropractic. And we'll use that as part of the basis for our legislation. Yeah. So they paid him pretty well. I think they paid him $2,000 a month or something back in the 1951. Oh, oh. And he went back to Davenport and he talked to some of his faculty he got access to some of the archives that they had at the time, some of the old writings from chiropractic. Um, he went to courthouses and looked for old court records from lawsuits and, and legal battles. And he, he took everything that he could at the time and compiled this really massive, you know, eight volume report. But it, it's the way he wrote it was basically um, kind of like a novel. He wrote it kind of like a play. It's, it's <laughs> kind of funny the way he wrote it. And what we understand now, the, the gaps in his knowledge where he didn't really, you know, he had one fact here and another fact here, but they didn't necessarily tie together. So he just made up a story to tie them together. Right. He just made stuff up in a lot of cases based on facts. Right. So he's got some facts in there and then stuff that he just made up. And then it never got published. But these early chiropractors um, that started the chiropractic journal, right, these uh, Gibbons was the first he was the editor of the chiropractic history journal. He's the first editor of this new association. And Gibbons and some of these early historians got access to Lerner's report. So they read it and they didn't check the facts. They didn't go back and see, let's see if he's right. They just assumed he was. Yeah. So they started publishing his ideas in peer review papers as yeah. if they were true and they weren't. Right. So just, just get the enormity of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of these guys also had biases like, like Gibbons and this other guy, Reem. You can see that he got the cover here after he passed as the father of the Association of Chiropractic History. <laughs> so Gibbons published a paper in 1981. Reem published a paper in 1986. And both of these papers stated emphatically that modernized chiropractic was published first, that the Palmer's book was a was was published to try to compete with Langworthy's book. They even got the authors mixed up. They said Langworthy was the main author, and we now know it wasn't. It was actually Smith who was the main author. Also, when you look at their stuff, and we have this in our paper, there's real evidence of bias against D.D. Palmer and against B.J. Palmer in all three of these authors. So not only do they have the facts wrong saying, oh, their book was second, and they just kind of threw this book together because they wanted to compete with these guys, but they also were biased against them calling them ignorant and all kinds of things you know that they just weren't prepared and that this guy Langworthy was the, sort of the savior of the profession so they created this whole narrative about early chiropractic as the authorities of on chiropractic history right, right? so they set the tone for the whole field of chiropractic history in that decade and and their facts were wrong and their writings were biased. I mean, they not all their facts were wrong, right? And, and some of the papers they published are quite good. And they collected lots of data about chiropractic history that's valuable, right? So I'm not dismissing everything these guys did. When we look at it in this particular context, bias against the Palmers and incorrect facts, we need to look at everything they published with a fine tooth comb, right? And we need to look at, every paper that cites them 
or every paper that cites papers that cite them mm. and make sure that those references are grounded in actual facts and unbiased objective facts, right? So if there's a paper today saying that philosophy is a waste of time and chiropractic history is not that important, and that guy cites a paper who goes and cites a paper back to one of these papers, hmm. you have to wonder whether that argument is valid, right? Yeah. So this, this puts a whole new twist on the way people are being taught in the schools, because this is what faculty study, right? And then faculty teach students for like two generations now, right? So this is really, it's, it's very um, troubling. Yeah. So this was a couple of their claims. One is that uh, Modernized Chiropractic was the first book and the demonstrated bias against the Palmers. Hmm. So I'm going to, I'll go back to this part of the story in just a minute, but now I'm going to give you another piece of the story, which was um, the Morikubo trial, yeah. which was another thing that Lerner wrote about. And this was where Lerner said that, um, well, I'll tell you, this this paper was the, the first paper that I published. Right, right now, it's the only paper that I've published as part of my PhD research. I published it with Professor Myers, who is a scientist, naturopath, medical doctor, just extraordinary mentor. So we, we took uh, my historical methodology and his... Um, his expertise in systematic literature reviews. Mm. And he challenged me while I was early on in my PhD. And he said, you keep mentioning this guy, Lerner. You keep mentioning this Morikubo report. What do we actually know about the Morikubo trial? Like, what are the actual facts we know? He said, why don't you, you know, do a little research and maybe we'll write a short little paper about this. Three months later, <laughs> like hundreds of sources later, I ended up uh, locating um, 190 primary sources oh. about the Morikubo trial. Because today we have so much more, right? We have all the newspaper accounts. So it turns out that Lerner, he really only had access to a few newspaper articles from reporters who were in the courtroom at this trial and just sort of expanded. Maybe he had a few other things. So I went back and, and our, our perspective was, let's try to reconstruct what happened at this trial. So I'll, I'll give you a little more context. So, and they also gave me the cover. So now I've had two covers of this incredible history, the journal, which is really, really great. Um, so in August 1907, right, so now this is a year after those books were published. That's why we'll go back to that story in a moment. Shigetoro Morikubo was brought up on trial for practicing medicine and osteopathy without a license in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And, and he was acquitted. He won the case. And at the case, they were able to demonstrate that Chiropractic had its own science, its own philosophy, and its own clinical practice. So it was separate from osteopathy. So this was the first landmark case that really separated chiropractic from osteopathy. Excuse me. So one of the keys, however, was that there were no court records. So anything that we knew about the trial was really from these secondhand sources and mainly from these early articles. So my challenge was to acquire as, as many primary sources as I could. And then, and then we decided we would try to only state something was a fact if we had three primary sources to support that actual fact. So we can really have a criteria that people could follow. And then when we published the paper, um, we we asked the journal editor, we, we kind of demanded that um, they include our data tables at the end of the article, because mm -hmm. we wanted this to be an objective, reproducible paper, because it's so controversial, right? We're saying that 
all of the history about this in we, we I found 53 peer review papers, book chapters, and PhD dissertations that had the facts incorrect about this trial. Mm -hmm. Textbooks, dissertations. Yeah. So this is so landmark to kind of change the whole literature around this. We we decided let's please just publish all of our data alongside it. And the data tables include quotes from all of these primary sources. So anyone now could go back to this whole document, which is 70 pages in the journal. They gave us pretty much our own issue. And anyone could go back and check every reference and see them all right there to actually reproduce our findings. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really, really a powerful way to, you know, look at the profession. Yeah. So just, just to get a little bit more of his story without dwelling on it too much, and people could get, go on to tick. I've got some lectures on this. Yeah. Here's that organization I mentioned earlier, the Universal Chiropractors Association. So that started in 1906, like I said, and Morikubo was now, um, he was at the Palmer campus now for about nine months. Um, he arrived in March 1906 while D.D. Palmer was still on campus. And he was there when D.D. Palmer got arrested and went to court for practicing medicine without a license and then went to jail for 23 days. Mm -hmm. And Morikubo was in the courtroom. And he couldn't believe his new mentor. He was a young Japanese aristocrat who had a degree. And he came from a family who were in the parliament. And his father was a governor. I mean, he, he was a well-educated young Japanese. And he couldn't believe how his new mentor was now being railroaded into jail. He even wrote an article in the, in the Davenport Times it was called something like, Are Americans Truly Free? Yeah. <laughs> and it was all about this. And so then when they formed this organization, the first thing they did in the fall of 1906 was they decided to send Morikubo to La Crosse, Wisconsin to test the new law. And mm -hmm. there was a new law in the state of Wisconsin Um against chiropractors basically it was a medical law that allowed an osteopath to sit on the board and that osteopath the year before had prosecuted two chiropractors in La Crosse Wisconsin huh. and they lost they weren't they weren't trained at Palmer they weren't really chiropractors but D.D. Palmer actually went to that trial which went up on the stand and these two guys lost so Morikubo goes to La Crosse, Wisconsin, opens up his office in the building of the osteopath that mm. was prosecuting the chiropractors, okay. took out a full page ad in the local paper, four columns, why chiropractic is better than osteopathy. I was like, he was a firebrand. And it was all about um, the innate brain, science, art, and philosophy. It was very philosophical. It really was using B.J. Palmer's latest ideas. And he was ready for battle. So they hired a lawyer and they knew he'd get arrested. So they were preparing for months and months for this trial. That's what our research showed. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, by the time they got to court in August, B.J. Palmer had now published his the second book, which was volume two in the Green Book series. And these were his new ideas about chiropractic. He was now, D.D. Palmer had left Davenport and B.J. had his own lectures and people asked him to write them down. So he published those as volume two. So this was basically what was used in the courtroom to explain the philosophy of chiropractic. BJ's latest teachings. They also taught D.D. Palmer's model of nerve tracing, which mm -hmm. was his original teaching of how to trace from the symptom around to the subluxation. And they asked the osteopaths in the courtroom, they put them up on the stand and they showed them photos like this. And they said, have you learned anything like this in osteopathy school? Mm -hmm. And they said, no. And they said, this is a chiropractic practice. This is called yeah. nerve tracing. And they also did the specific thrust and they demonstrated an osteopathic maneuver, which took about 30 minutes. 
and they demonstrated a chiropractic maneuver and they showed that that took about 30 seconds or less, that they were distinct practices. So they're able to show the philosophy, the science and the practice were different. Hmm. There's no evidence that they used um, the modernized chiropractic book, but Lerner says that the defense relied on modernized chiropractic as the main defense. He just made that up. There's no evidence. There there is evidence that said um, Morikubo gave all of the chiropractic books in print to the prosecution. But there's no evidence that the defense used that book in any way. It actually shows the opposite, that they relied on BJ's and DD's theories. Mm. So he's, he was acquitted. And um, usually when you read about the Morakubo trial, you'll read about Langworthy, you'll read about modernized chiropractic. And Lerner even said that because of this book, D.D. and B.J. had to change their whole philosophy now to become more legal. They had to adopt Langworthy's ideas because his book was used in this landmark case. None of that was true. But you see that today in peer review papers regularly. So not only that this book came first, that was part of the bias of why this book came first, because it was so important And it's a cool book. It's very important. I'm actually rereading it right now for our new book because we've got a whole chapter on Langworthy. But it's uh, there's no evidence that it was used in the classroom. So just to wrap up for our our new paper. So what we did was we looked at I wanted to see what kind of biases there were. So I took those 53 papers and articles and chapters that had their facts wrong about the Morakubo trial. And then we looked at those to see which one of those also say modernized chiropractic was published first. So, Hmm. you know, we were able to show that there were, you know, about 13 or so, or maybe 30 of those. And then, you know, when I ask students, you know, what, what to do today, you know, how do we know what the facts are if all of this literature is wrong? You know, I say, well, let's start here, right, with these two papers right, that I just shared with you, right? It's a good mm-hmm. place to start. And then we can also start with this, which I published this in 2019. Um, it actually says the 2018 issue. It came out in April 2019 while I was working on my PhD, and it was a 10-part series that I did for the Journal of Chiropractic Humanities, Hmm. and it's the history of the chiropractic vertebral subluxation from 1897 to 1997, and it's Hmm. very detailed. It's in PubMed. It's free. Anyone can read it, And the idea there was to give the profession its own history in PubMed so people can have a source of of accurate history about subluxation because what's being taught at the schools is very distorted. It's unfortunate, but for maybe 40 years now or more, there's been this misunderstanding of the actual history there's insufficient facts, and people are just kind of missing the boat in a lot of regard. So this is a way for people to start to really get, you know, a solid foundation, yeah. and which, again, why we started, you know, Tick. Well, we, we could stop there, I guess, and just talk a little bit. You know, I could go on for days, but let's Yeah, um... <laughs> I would love to. Yeah, well, this is great, and I think that... Yeah, the... yeah. Those three articles that you show there is like something that every chiropractor and chiropractic student should uh, get their hands on and and become a member of uh, the chiropractic institute. You said that now you there's so much in that platform to get access to our history, our philosophy, and uh, those that who's on shoulder we stand, all the great people that has. Uh, passed on and those that you say the interview people that are still alive as well of the yeah yeah i've been doing these yeah i'm calling it the tick legacy series where i'm i'm doing these really 
two hour sessions. So I'm doing the first hour a Zoom and I'm asking some of these you know, older chiropractors who've been around, some of them who knew BJ Palmer or heard him speak yeah. and asking them to just tell me their chiropractic story. Yeah. And then we're getting together for a second hour. And sometimes they're just telling me more stories. And some of them I've been inviting people to also give a presentation like we're doing. So we're doing these sort of two hour tick legacy series. And then we've also got just lots of old footage. Yeah. So we've been just posting old talks and even some talks from the 80s and 90s that were given at Sherman College. I'm talking with Life West right now about using some of their class talks. And I'm even talking with Cleveland College about some of their archives. And my goal is to have an online source where the whole profession could come together and get the facts yeah. and from the same basic understanding for really the first time in our history where we can all have the same footing of what is the history, what is the philosophy, yeah. and then have a place where we can discuss it. So it's also a social space, kind of like Facebook. Yeah. And that part hasn't really caught on yet, but we're, we're actually launching an app soon. So people will have it on their phones. You'll be able to message other chiropractors. We'll have some discussion forums. So the, the idea is to create an only chiropractic space where we can have our own little universe of, of ideas and discussion. That's great. That's great. I think, I mean, the art, science, and philosophy. I mean, uh, there's been such a huge focus on science and that's very important. I mean, this is science, what you do, but it's not the science it's research within the literature, research into our history. It's not what the general chiropractor thinks of as science. Then we look at, you know, uh, research in regards to do we have an effect on headache, migraines, or things like that. Uh, this is so important so that we don't get lost. And I know many uh, learning institutions within chiropractic the, the history and the philosophy is just becoming less and less and less and more and more distorted as this yeah. book from you is so sh clearly showing that there's a, there's a lack of knowledge about our history and there's a distortion about what is philosophy, what is the philosophy of chiropractic, what is the history actually. And it's yeah. amazing how quickly that can happen. It's not, I mean, 895, it's not, that long in one regard and how quickly things can get off track yeah totally and that and that's what's fascinating too because again it, it is not a very long time mm. so it's possible for us to have a real understanding of what happened yeah right? yeah we just have the facts in front of us and and also in, you know and even regarding science you know we the evidence-based science is really, um, you know, there are facets to it, right? Mm -hmm. Clinical controlled trials is one maybe highest standard, right? But there are other standards of evidence-based practice that involve clinical experience, that involve um, uh, realistic theoretical knowledge based on anatomy and physiology, and chiropractors relied on those two strands for many, many decades, and they have their own validity. They're not, they're not invalid. They're just not as high on the hierarchy, but they're still valid. Yeah. So that's what's really important when people are thinking about the history, not just the politics and the accreditation, but the history of our own research and our own clinical experience and look at what within that has validity claims and what within that could we try to reproduce with new studies yeah. rather than just dismiss it all as if it never happened. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing. You got to just ask people when they say things like there's no research for this, you have to say, what are your references to make that statement? Yeah. Right? What's your evidence to say there's no evidence? Yeah. And 
you know that's that's something that that people is, need that to know. is in, a very interesting topic to 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 uh, for another discussion to expand on in regards to the, the trend of uh, reductionism where you do research and you try to exclude as many factors as possible uh, and then the, the more the deductionistic way that the vitalistic principle based chiropractic is based on when you look at research from that perspective you have this sociobiological research which is becoming more and more uh, prominent that you take in regards to what presuppositions does the practitioner have the person that's seeking the care how is their interaction there's so many facets that you can take into perspective when you have a that whole view of the human being and human interaction in regards to just to try to limit away as much as possible yeah absolutely yeah yeah and that's a, a whole nother piece to our our institute that we can go into maybe we'll do another talk on the the integral view of it exactly. that that's what's this it's essential to you know look at things from as many perspectives as we can and to um make our truth claims from multiple perspectives exactly so it's it's just because they're real and they're true. You, yeah. Right? yeah. What you know, that's like when I got in contact with Cam Wilbur and uh, uh, the Integral Institute. Yeah, it's twenty years more than that. Uh, that perspective, all quadrants, all levels. What if that was like uh, the perspective that research came out of? And I know that that's the the view the meta view that you utilize when you're doing your research and the the new publication that's coming out you spoke about earlier in may is uh having that all quarters yeah. all levels well actually the the even more expanded version with the all the inner and outer perspective yeah i'm, I'm going to be presenting my my research um at sherman at iraps in may and I've also been, uh, my paper has been accepted to the North American Integral Conference, which is also mm -hmm. in May. So I'm going to present my new methodology from my thesis, which applies Wilbur's integral model. I actually dedicated my PhD thesis to Wilbur. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I, I got to see him. I went out to a mile high in Denver this last year and I got to visit with him. We, we, we go way back now. And so whenever I can, I try to get up and say hello. And, and I brought him my PhD thesis, which is 2000 pages and wow. I, with, with the appendices. And I gave it to him and he actually went through a lot of it for about 40 minutes while we sat and talked. And, and he actually told me he was very impressed, which is really coming from him is like highest yeah. praise you can get. Yeah. Yeah. I do hope we can get back on that uh, uh, later on this year when you, it's yeah. out and published, but you can talk more about that research and touch ground on that and, and delve deeper into that perspective as well with integral the the new meta model which i think is so uh well it's not new it's been around for a long but it's 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 gr more research growing and there's more people utilizing it uh i think it's um uh, an understanding is so essential for the future of uh, research and and learning uh, and and yeah. making it pragmatic in life as well which is also an essential part yeah totally and in practice too i find it's essential for practice for chiropractors hmm. but we'll go we'll go more down there yeah well, that sounds great that. yeah that's amazing so i will post this and and spread the word and uh i do hope that all the people that stayed on for this long if you're a chiropractor a chiropractor student please at least get hold of these three uh articles I'll, I'll post links where you can get hold of them as well and obviously links to i do hope most people will also take the opportunity to become a member of the chiropractic institute and uh, delve into this rich source to get access to our heritage uh, and get grounded in it because it's a sad thing when chiropractors and chiropractic students uh, me included i was you know studying in the uk grad 96 from acc uh, there was so little of uh, history and philosophy. So most of it has come through the years and there's still more to learn and more to learn, not at least through amazing people as yourself that is so dedicated to uh, 
to not preserve because it's this is an upgrade as you say that you know that's <laughs> to conserve and being dogmatic that's not what we desire it's the to delve and find the truth what is as well as we can from the sources what actually yeah. happened what was actually occurring as this critical uh, Murakubu case for one thing which is uh, you know monumental in the, in the history of chiropractic and legislation and so forth uh, so yeah yeah totally yeah my thesis the title of my thesis is truth lies and chiropractic wow wow yeah. it gives me goosebumps <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right my friend this is great let's be in touch i look yeah. forward to connecting with you more thank you ever so much